good questions. I like your questions, Muema. They make you think and they make you deep, reach deep into your soul for an answer. Uh, they kind of humble you, humble you out a little bit. So where are you based? I'm in, right now, I'm in Utica, New York, upstate. And, Is that where you live? Well, yeah, that's where I live now. Mm -hmm. um, my parents, Muema, live in the city. Okay. Spanish Harlem. Yep. I come down every two weeks to check up on them and kind of hang out a little bit with in the city mm -hmm. and go to events and things of that nature. I've got a video event I have to attend June 3rd in Staten Island. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I'll be recording a music set, a DJ set for about an hour, and we're going to have another interview then. Mm -hmm. uh, but all is good. All is good. And um, what brought you to Utica versus like Syracuse or Albany or someplace else? Um, it's a long story. Short. Um, I moved up in August of 1996. You know, my, my full-time job at that point, you know, I was a government employee. So I worked for the government and I had a transfer from the city. Um, I came up and started working my government job in Oswego. And then I had an accident in the snow and I requested a transfer to Utica. And mm -hmm. here I am. And I retired a couple of years ago. And I still come down to the city to visit my parents because uh, they're older. They're in their 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, I almost lost mom due to COVID when the COVID situation was pretty intense a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but she pulled through, they're both alive and I check up on them. You know, they're, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's mom and dad. You know what I mean? Absolutely. You Absolutely. know, and, uh, they, they give me a lift spiritually with everything that I do. So mm -hmm. why not reciprocate and do what you can for them? So that's me at this point. Other than that, all is good. I love music. Music has been my life, and the club scene has been, uh, you know, things have changed. Things have changed. Save, save that for the interview. Save that for the interview. <laughs> um, okay. So so, so let's get started. Today is Monday, May 15th, 2023. Who are we speaking with? Ray Pinky Velasquez. How'd you get the name Pinky? Third grade. Tallest guy in the class by the name of Eric Arzola started making fun of me because I was the shortest guy in the class and he starts calling me Pinky to make fun of me. Well, it caught on in the class and everybody's calling me Pinky. And I was the smartest guy in the class. So a lot of the kids, a lot of my friends from school would come home and I would help do their homework in my house. And they started calling me Pinky at home. And my mother liked the sound of that and started calling me Pinky. <laughs> okay. So here I am, Ray Pinky Velasquez on all my records. Pinky, Pinky, Pinky. But it's a nickname that was given to me. And I use it. <laughs> Tell people who is Ray Pinky Velasquez. Let me let me share something. <clears throat> I go back a long way with my studio work, my remixes, my additional productions in the studio. I was a Billboard reporting DJ back in the Billboard reporting days. I reported to uh, Record World and Vince Aletti at Record World and Brian Chin. At Record World, I reported my playlist, my my club playlist to those trades to Cashbox, 
magazine, Michael's thing, Mike Ma um, uh, magazine. Bottom line, you know, I've been involved in a lot of big records from the disco era, from the core of the dance music era. Uh, I've been involved with hip hop. I signed and founded Public Enemy uh, under the name when they first started of Spectrum City. They, we signed them to Vanguard. I produced their first record, Lies, back with um, um, Check Out the Radio, which was the, the second single on the same 12 inch. And uh, that record was featured on the Oliver Stone film, South Central. But I produced their first record. We wanted to do another record with Spectrum City. And we were in the middle of having success at Vanguard Records with uh, Twilight 22, which was another hip hop, uh, Africa Bombada, Planet Rock type of a record. And we were so involved with Twilight 22 that we let um, Spectrum City go. And their very next single on Columbia Records under the name, under the new name of Public Enemy, uh, they were um, Spectrum City at Vanguard. They changed their name to Public Enemy and they took off with the very first single, they became mega stars. So, but that was my, I founded them. Um, so I've been involved in a lot of different types of records, Muema. Got it. Hip hop, rap, DOR, dance oriented rock type of music. We had end games on the flip label, which was, the sister label of Vanguard Records. And on that label, we only introduced dance-oriented rock type of records. I always went for the more of the funkier type of rock records, because I believe funk always has a foothold in the dance music market, a big part of the dance music market is based on funk. Today it's, you know, you want to call it house. It's all funk oriented dance. And um, I've always believed in that. I've always loved the garage for what Larry did there. David Mancuso at the loft and, you know, how he spiritually created a movement there with his loft parties. Um, but funk, even with David, funk, and R&B were the pulse of what was going on. Lower Manhattan is always, to me, the foothold of a lot of dance music. People can argue about the fact that house music started in Chicago. Uh, Frankie Knuckles was a big part of that, yes. That's true, but I believe that New York, without New York City and the dance movement, um, I don't think you would see a lot of these other branches of cities doing what they do. If it wasn't for New York having some kind of inner spirit connecting to all of these um, uh, cities. So, you know, in New York City, it's, it's the Mecca. You know, when you think of New York, it's where everybody wants to visit. It's where everybody wants to come to feel the vibration. New York has, you know, and, and I'm not just talking music, I'm talking fashion. I mean, New York invites the world to check it out because there's something ahead of the pulse with New York and the dance music, um, um, you know, back in the seventies when disco was hot, you know, New York was a, was a happening 
environment. I mean, you can go to clubs 24 hours a day, seven days a week in that time frame, and find clubs all over the place. So it was a great, exciting time, Muema, New York, um, and the dance movement and the disco movement. And it's changed. It's changed a lot now. But one thing I always respect that even though things change, uh, it's always the youth. It's always that part of the industry, youth, that dictates the direction of where everything is going. So, you know, so you, you listen to dance music today. If you're an old timer, you want to hear that. You want to hear the vinyl. You want to hear the analog. You want to hear the good sound, the great crisp, crisp sound. But today, if you have a laptop and you have a computer and you have, a, you know, these DJs are doing their stuff on, on electronically and they're locking in those beats. And that's the name of the game today. Um, it's different. But there isn't there's a there's a huge environment that's thriving on this new setting. And in five, ten years, it'll be different. And it'll be a new uh, system of dance. It is what it is. The world is always changing. You have a new cell phone, another one comes in, and everybody wants the new one. You can't stop it. It's the way it's the way life works but we have memories memories give us some kind of connection to feel that we belong and you know you think of the loft and what david mancuso did there and you think of larry at the garage you know and and uh what's his and mel sharon who had you know who did a lot for the garage um and you think of Nikki Siano at the at the gallery. Um, you know, these are clubs that set the tone. You know, and, and another thing too, um, Muema, back in the day, you had clubs. The radio stations were circulating the clubs. Frankie Crocker was visiting the garage. Barry Mayo from Kiss FM was visiting the garage. You had record companies circulating, bringing their acetates and test pressings to the clubs. So you had a trilogy of excitement going on. It was just not the music. You had the record industry hanging out. You don't have that anymore today. You don't see that anymore today. So no matter how exciting it is to go to the, an event, you don't have that secondary and third element around the club scene, giving it an extra boost, an extra level of excitement that captured your spirit. You know, so it's all change, but it is what it is. You know, I think artists today struggle in this environment. There's just too many records coming out and artists come out and it's a global situation. It's global competition now. So artists come out and a month later, they're gone. They're history <clears throat> because there's so much competition. Um, so it's a rougher environment for an artist to survive in but it does open the door for everyone to come in and give it a shot with a record so it's an open door uh the only problem is that uh, artists do not live too much today um you know i it's it's very it's it's different um to me i i you know i spent time um, DJing at the Ipanema Discotheque in Manhattan, <clears throat> which was two blocks away from Studio 54 on West 52nd Street. And that was a Brazilian 
nightclub. And we played, I played a lot of, you know, I played disco, I played R&B, I played uh, a lot of stuff. And there was a lot of excitement in the club, strictly because I was reporting a lot of records to the trade magazines. I was mixing and producing records. So that brought in a lot of excitement itself to the club. And we had a lot of fun. It was fun. I Let me tell you, I think the greatest days of my life, if I can think about the things that really uh, made me happy, being a DJ, working at a record company, Vanguard Records, doing both of those things, wearing both of those hats and enjoying what I was doing is the epitome for me of uh, my, my youth. And to me, music, music, Muema, is the fountain of youth, no matter how old you are. It's, there's something about music that keeps you alive. It gives you a foothold on life. I agree. What do you want your legacy to be? I think if people can, first of all, those that knew me, that came to see me at Deep Anima, they know the environment that I created in that club. And again, I took a little bit from the other DJs, from uh, Walter Gibbons, from David Mancuso, from Larry. I, I absorbed their wisdom and chemistry into what I did. And I had my own style, but I always had that vision of David, Larry, uh, Nikki, um, Frankie Knuckles, good friend of mine, rest in peace, <clears throat> um, in what I did. I think if people can remember the, the joy that I gave them with my spiritual journeys that I created with my music, taking my audience to a level where the epitome for them was to take off their shirts and let loose because the music was leading them in that direction. And if they can remember those days, that would be something fantastic for me to hold on to as a legacy. On the other side of the coin, the records that I've produced, that I've mixed, that were successful, that reaches out to a broader audience, radio, sales, and if people can look at a record and see my name at the bottom in small print produced by or mixed by Ray Pinky Velasquez and they pull out that record and, and want to hear it or they pull out that file on a computer and they want to hear that record and when they hear it, they say, I remember that record at the Ipanema. Well, I remember hearing Fonda Ray singing over like a fat rat at the garage and what she did to the audience. That's a, a connection to me that is spiritual. I take that with me when I'm gone. And it gives me a sense of oneness with the universe to have that. And I wish everyone could have that because it's a great feeling. You feel love, you feel appreciation, you feel a connection to the universe because you touch lives with your music.
thank you for that. Um, the next question is, sure. uh, what is your intention when you DJ? Good question, Wemma. That's a very good question. When I get behind at least two turntables or in that DJ booth and I look at my audience, I look at what's forming on the dance floor. I look at facial expressions. I look at the clothing. I look at what my audience, I project who they are as people. I project what their sense of security is. And I try to feed music that will take that environment to another level of spiritual joy, if I can say that. Um, it's not just plain records. Any, any person can get behind a turntable and play a record and then play another record, and then play another record, and then play another record, and keep that going all night. It's not about playing records. It's about communicating a message to the spirit of the dance floor. That's easier said than done. But... It's taking your audience on a journey where the music is saying something. It's saying, this is about you. This music connects to your lifestyle. It connects with you as a person and makes you feel that you belong on, in this club because I understand who you are and the music is feeding that vibration and people let go because they feel that they're at home. That's different than just playing records. <laughs> Absolutely. You know what I mean, Wemma? You know I, what I'm talking about. I know exactly what you mean, yeah. Yeah. Tell us about the first time you went to the Paradise Garage. Describe for us that, that experience. What did you see? What did you hear? Let me tell you. I, you know, obviously for me to go to the garage, I must have heard something about this place. Yes, the popularity was becoming big. Um, all I kept hearing was Richard Long and his sound system. An, inc an incredible sound system, an incredible large parking garage in Lower Manhattan on King Street. You got to go check it out. It's, it's bigger than life. So most DJs, they feel a connection. They understand decent sound, big sound systems. I mean, clubs were all over the place, so you couldn't, you couldn't um, not understand that all clubs had some kind of a sound system, bass, highs, but some clubs had more than others. Some clubs were a little bit more impressive with their sound. Well, the talk of town, the talk of the town was the Paradise Garage. You know, huge, huge sound. So when I got there, getting back to your questions, when I when I went down, and I can't remember exactly what year it was, Muema, but it was definitely during the 
mid 70s. And when I got down to King Street and saw the line and felt the base from the street. And, you know, you had to walk up a ramp and it was a huge line. And as you're walking up the ramp, the base is thundering down that ramp. You felt like you were in a, in a different planet. You felt like you didn't think that a sound system could be so powerful, so massive, so threatening to your space. That's how big it was. And you felt that bass going up the ramp, you know, and it was crowded, long line, and you're feeling boom, boom, boom. You know, it's coming on you, it's hitting you. And then you walk into the club and everybody's having a great time. If it felt like it felt like New Year's every time you went to the garage, everybody's just letting loose, being who they are. It doesn't matter. You're you're free to share your emotions any way you want. And the music is thunderous and loud. It's like being in heaven. If you're a dancer, if you're a part of the garage. And that's what and they created that environment. And again, David Mancuso had that as well. You know, but um, it was awesome. And you take that spirit from the garage and you try to you try to go back to your club and find the way to replicate that even though you don't have the same sound system as the garage, but you want to create that environment where people are free to be themselves. So that was my first impression at the garage, you know, an incredible, an incredible sense of, of oneness to the universe with the universe, in a club. Freedom, mm. joy, euphoria, <laughs> Muema land. <laughs> Next question, sure. what, does, what does Sao Sol mean to you? Well, you know, Sao Sol and, and the name itself, it's like soul, salsa and soul, a Latin based record company. And, you know, when you think of double exposure, 10%, my love is free. Um, What was the T. Scott record that he did? Um, T. Scott did mix the record on Sal, so uh, Love Thing, I, Love Thing. Um, you think of um, the early, the early connection to all clubs, but with a Latin flavor. And I'm not saying that my love is free or double exposure have Latin rhythms in the record, but the label itself was started with that flavor of uh, of a Latin soul type of um, ingredient in their music. Um, but I do think uh, that Salso Records set a big tone, a huge tone with their um, catalog of music uh, going back to the 70s. I mean, I played a lot of Salso Records. Uh, you couldn't, you know, when you think of Columbia Records and 
uh, Gamble and Huff and what they did. Well, there was part, you know, Gamble and Huff were part of a lot of the South Soul productions. And uh, there was a lot of Gamble and Huff influence in the South, South Soul music. Um, so it was a very interesting label with their music, I think. Great music. What lessons or values did you learn from your time at David Mancuso's record pool that continue to shape in a, your approach to music and your career today? Good question. Very good question. Every time I think of music, when I think of dance music, Muema, I have to be, you know, let me give you an example. When you think of your life and why you're here doing this interview today with me or all of the B Bounce FM interviews, where does that come from? Why are you doing these interviews? There's, there's, there's something in your past that brought you here? Well, for me, when I think of my past <clears throat> and where I am today, I have to tip my hat. I have to, you know, embrace the soul of David Mancuso for what he did. I was, I was there when he started, when he was, running his pool and doing his loft parties. I saw how, how difficult it was to, be, to get into the record pool. You had to provide a letterhead from your club. You had to prove that you were there. You had to be working so many nights a week, not just one night a week. David wanted to make sure that the record companies would, would send records to the pool and he wanted the record companies to know that the records were going to hands of professional DJs that were going to evaluate these records. So he was very stringent on how to get into the pool. Um, and I respected that. I respected that he was hard on the DJs, but he created a chemistry of members that stood the test of time with being great DJs because they worked at great clubs and provided obviously great music and great feedback. I remember when Donna Summer first performed at the loft, it was in the afternoon during the week and Casablanca Records invited all the DJs from David's pool to be there to showcase Donna Summer. We didn't know who she was, but that was the billing for the event that weekday, Donna Summer performing live at the loft. I didn't know who she was. So we're all waiting and out comes Donna Summer, and she's about five foot three on stage, and she starts singing Love to Love You, Baby. 16 minutes, whatever the length of that record was, on stage. Lights dim, they get bright, get dim. The atmosphere gets a little sexy because it's a very sexy record. Lights dim. At the end of the show, everybody's going wild for Donna Summer. First time we see her. Love doing Love to Love You, Baby. Incredible. At the loft. All of David Mancuso's DJs were there witnessing the event, feeling the spirit of Donna Summer for the first time. I remember that. I take that with me. And again, David Mancuso. I remember David through that. So I live with Dave. David has something, you know, David 
I remember David Mancuso with his Thorin's turntables on the second on the second level above the dance floor, and a little light behind him, shining on him from behind. I remember David without a without a shirt and his long hair, and that little light shining on him on the second floor as he's spinning records. He looked like Jesus Christ. I mean, that was the image of David Mancuso. He looked like Jesus Christ up there. And that spiritually was a connection to the dance floor. God is playing music for us. <laughs> and I, I can't let go of that. That's, a, that's another connection. You know, it's funny how life is, Mwema. We can talk about things. But talk is one thing, and seeing things in action bring a different level of communication that touches the spirit. And David had that, you know, David was, he was very straightforward. He's very he wasn't lying to you about anything, but he was, you know, when he had to be very stringent and hard because of what he was trying to do, you felt that. You felt that he was not going to play games with letting you become a member just because you knew him or, or you knew somebody or one of his friends. David was very black and white <clears throat> when dealing with issues. But he was also very memorable in the things he did. You know, he, you know, the loft parties, you know, there was no liquor. And the environment was be yourself. He played the music. He wasn't a technically sound mixing DJ, but who cares? It was a house party, like the old house parties. You go to a house party, DJs weren't technical. They were playing one record, you know, at a time, and the beats didn't match. It didn't matter. It was the environment of party, and you're having a good time. It was David's parties were huge house parties. You know, that's where they were. And he looked like Jesus Christ playing records. I mean, David Mancuso um, was himself. And I loved him. I loved him because he was himself. Um, he did something for me when I saw how he did ran his record pool the members that were coming in to be part of the pool and his parties at the loft they all the that whole chemistry was enough to to for me to remember him forever um you worked at Vanguard Records. Tell us the secret of making a hit record. Good question. Good question, Wema. Um, I believe I now I grew up in the 60s before the club scene listening to WABC radio, which is basically top 100 music. Motown, Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, early Michael Jackson, Thelma Houston. I also was listening to the Rolling Stones, the Beatles. Bottom line, what I'm trying to say is that all of these, all of this music that I listened to had something similar, even though the categories of music was different, rock, Motown, 
the theme was the same. They all had good melodies. A hit record. And I took that with me into Vanguard Studios when I started mixing, remixing. And even today, I have a record coming out soon called Ready or Not. And it's melodic. A good record, besides having a beat, a rhythm track, a funky bass line, which DJs can relate to, but we all know that a hot club record may not be a hit record. What is a hit record? A hit record touches radio, touches clubs, touches sales, bottom line sales and downloads. If you have all of that with your record, you possibly have a hit record. Now, a hit record always stands the test of time. Years later, you could hear it again and be right there in that environment as if you first heard it the first time. There's something about a good song that brings you back in time. Doesn't have to be a dance record. It could be a ballad. A good record has a good melody. And it's something that when you listen to it, makes you feel good inside. That's, that's, the, that's what good records, hit records have. They have good melodies and they stand the test of time. They're good songs. You think of what Stevie Wonder did, Superstition. You know, you think about, um, you know, a lot of, you know, early Michael Jackson, I Want You Back, you know, a little bubble gum, but it's, the melody's cute. The melody stays in your mind. You don't have to go to a club to like it. You can listen to it on the radio and it makes you feel good. It's got a good melody. So good records have that ingredient. Now, if you take a good melody, something that you can sing and and uh, um, and and hum because the melody is so memorable and you put a good bass line and rhythm track on that now you've got the the chemistry for what I would call a hit record two part question sure what's your greatest? achievement as a DJ and what's your biggest regret as a DJ? Good questions. I like your questions, Mwema. They make you think and they make you deep, reach deep into your soul for an answer. Uh, they kind of humble you, humble you out a little bit. Um, I think my epitome as a DJ, back in 1977, um, I was playing a record at the Ipanema called, it was a French record. It was, and the, and the title was in French. The title of the record was called A Chacon Son, S O N, Un Francais. Translates to English, Childhood Forever. The name of the group on the Canadian label was Recreation Harmony. I was playing two versions. I was playing two 45s because the record was only uh, available on a 45, seven inch. So, and it was instrumental. And I was playing both instrumentals back to back in, at the Ipanema, creating a frenzy with this instrumental. 
I finally went to a company called Dynamo Records with this record. Now, give you a little bit more insight on what I'm going to say. The owner of the company was an old, I forget, his name was Art something. Can't remember his last name, Art. He was about maybe 76, 77 years old. And I got to meet him because he, he had put out a couple of records. One was called Dris Disco Dracula, which was a real horrible record. You know, think of, think of the name Disco Dracula, and you can see that their thinking of dance music, disco music, has got to be left of center somehow. And it was. But I met with Art because I saw the music he was putting out. So I called him. He told me to come over. We sat down. We talked. And I took him down to the garage on a Saturday night. And he was scared to death of the environment. He couldn't believe. You know what he told me? He says, Ray, this is a sick scene here. <laughs> I say, okay, don't let it bother you. It's just, this is, this is what, this is, this is the pulse of what your label should be trying to please with your music. He had a middle America vision of disco. You know, you watch American Bandstand, you get a little idea of what he was trying to reach out to with his disco music. White middle America, preppy environment, so you take him down to the garage and it's like, oh, this is like culture shock, you know? Okay, but there is a reason why I took him down there so that he can open up his mind to the reality of what was going on in the city. So I brought him this record. I told him, Art, License the record from Canada. It's not going to cost you a lot of money. You'll have the rights to release the record here in the States. I'll do the mix. Create a six, seven minute version. Release it. Service all the record pools. 4,000 copies across the, the country. And obviously you're servicing New York. David Mancuso's pool, IDRC, Judy Weinstein's pool for the record. And it'll put your label on the map with what's going on. There'll be, you'll have more credibility. People will be more in, in, inclined to um, pull out Dynamo Records, whenever there's a Dynamo Record released. Okay, so we did that. We released the record. The record became top, top 15 in the Billboard dance charts. I was nominated in 1978 for Disco Mix of the Year on that record. I didn't win the nomination. I didn't win Disco Mix of the Year, but I was nominated with Walter Gibbons and he had um, uh, what's uh, Law and Order, Love Committee, uh, Tom Savarese, Dance, Dance, Dance. So I was competing with them. I didn't win, but I got nominated and the label had a lot of respect respectability. That to me, was a big memory. Getting back to your question, um, Muema, about something that happened mm -hmm. uh, that that I I don't forget. I have that record hanging on my wall 
right now and I look at it and I still remember the whole thing with Dynamo Records. So that's a good question. And it really brought back good memories. Um, what was the second half of your question? There was another question that you had tied biggest, into. Biggest regret. Biggest regret. I would say the biggest regret for me You know, when you think, you know, I think of John Jellybean Benitez, good friend of mine, respected person in the music industry, dance music part of the industry. You know, he, he brought in Madonna, introduced her. Um, actually, Mark Kamen's brought in Madonna, but Jelly Bean did produce, uh, I believe, uh, Holiday. Um, my regret was, my regret was never able, never being able to achieve the level of success that John Benitez did and you know we all come from the same school we were all djs john benitez and tony carrasco were good friends um in the early days they even went to clubs and performed dj contests to see what djs were you know were better than others i mean that this kind of stuff but john 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 took things a step higher and he knew that the dance floor the club scene was was one thing but producing records having your records having been associated with film carlito's way you know or or uh uh organizing the music for that movie. You know, he did things on an upper scale that to me signified a person that had no limits in reaching for goals, for reaching um, another level of success. And that to me is something that <clears throat> I always admired about John not being fearful to go after a higher level in this business, which takes work, takes sacrifice, and quietly, you know, like I mentioned to a lot of people, Muema, and you can vouch for this too, success is not something that you obtain. It's an ongoing process. You know, life is pain management. When you think about it, take two steps back, one step forward. Two steps back, one step forward. Two steps back, another step forward. And it's from those tiny steps forward that's putting you in a direction of where your destiny is, but it takes all that pain going back to give you that sense of vision of taking those other steps forward. And that's how life is for all of us. No one just wakes up. You know, they say, there's that saying, it takes 25 years to become an overnight success. Think about that. <laughs> There's, there's a lot of pain before you get there. And while you're getting there, you're still going after a higher level and people are already talking about you where you are. And that's how success is. And many times success is even bigger after you're gone. Why is that? Because people now can look at you, look at your legacy and pick out the good things and highlight them, even though you've been through hell and back to make it happen. 
And that's how it is for all of us. So one thing you have to do is learn how to enjoy <clears throat> the process of making it happen. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. This was a great interview. Last question. When people want to book you, how do they get a hold of you? Um, they can communicate with me, uh, with me directly uh, through my site. I have a contact form at raypinkyvelasquez.com. Or you can send me a, an email at bigpinkray, B-I-G-P-I-N-K-R-A-Y, big pinkray at gmail.com and we can talk it talk it up and and uh, see where we are with an agreement for an event i would love to do that awesome thank you so much thanks again great great all right have a good day you have a great day too Moima. good nice meeting you too good man good meeting you 